let's cover Matthew 24. So, as the job of a preacher and teacher is to teach right doctrine. There is so much wrong doctrine going on, going on nowadays in churches. And because of that, it weakened our focus on the scriptures where we can apply right doctrine in our lives and grow properly. How can we grow properly if we believe in wrong things from the Bible, right? So that's why it is important to have right doctrine. We live in the day and age of end times. There's no doubt about that. We're like on the verge, near the borderline of the tribulation. As we are in the end times, the Word of God already gave you things in the Bible that gives you a heads up, an idea, an awareness of the end times. And the book of Revelation especially covered that. In order to see the end times approach, a lot of the things that I have taught and some of the controversial things and the really deep stuff and the interesting stuff with conspiracies and end times, you got to realize this. This all came from a mindset of a literal approach, taking the Bible literally as it says. And in order to have that, you have to have the right book, that's believing right. every word is perfect. Right. So that's why we don't believe in 200 plus modern versions. So we believe the King James Bible, literally taking every word as it says. By doing that, we can find the right interpretation, what the Bible talks about the end times. The second approach is a dispensational mindset. A dispensational mindset, what that means is we believe in rightly dividing time periods. So not every verse in the Bible, not every time period that the verses are talking about will be applying to us. By having a dispensational approach where we divide the tribulation from us Christians, we can better see what's going to happen at the end times at the last days and what Satan's up to. But a lot of people, they hate these two approaches. Now, when you get into philosophical Greek and Hebrew shenanigans, that gets rid of the KJV literal approach. So you already attacked this. So Greek and Hebrew, and I'm going to put quote-unquote scholasticism, scholarship. Why do you say quote-unquote pastor? Because they didn't graduate from prestigious universities. So I hesitate to use scholarship. And some of these will boast themselves to be scholars, and they don't even have a doctorate. They talk like Greek and Hebrew professionals, and they, you look up where they graduated from, you look at their degrees, and they don't know a hill of beans. So that's why um, I really criticize these people because these people act like elitists right. on the common Christian when they themselves are not actually elitists themselves. So that's hypocrisy and liars at its finest. The second thing that attacks the dispensational approach is the approach concerning preterism or preterism. So several different people have different ways of pronouncing it. But anyways, let's just say preterism. So preterism, what this does is that they believe that these end times that are occurring in the book of Revelation have already been fulfilled at the first centuries. So they don't believe this is future. We put this as future, right? right. It's like a dust statement, isn't it? But these people will act like scholars and they'll belittle you and call you sci-fi fantastical mindsets and they'll say that, no, it's more accurate that you put that the first century. Now, I don't know how you do that. You've got to be definitely fantastical to put all of this fulfilled at first century, not this. And they're the ones that accuse us for that. So, so Jeff Durbin from Apologia Studios, he keeps having this guy, Gary, coming over and trying to... Uh, act like scholars when they're not actually scholars themselves, and then they'll boast and talk about that. Oh, yeah, these Christians, they come up with sci fi apocalyptic nonsense. Wow. And then they're trying, because they know, they know that the dispensational end times teaching is spreading on the internet and people are opening their eyes to it. So, because of that, they're trying to take advantage of the platform through their professional scholar, scholarly, eloquent language and demeanor. And by doing that, they're trying to win the affection of the people that if you're really smart like me, then you're going to believe what I say. When you cloud it with uh, eloquent language and terminologies and gobbledygook, you can fool anybody. Yeah. You can fool anybody. Good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the who? Simple. That's being simple-minded. Yeah. 
All right, so here's their reasoning for this. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. And then we'll read verse 34. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 24, and then we'll read verse 34. This is their reasoning. Now, we, we argue Matthew 24 is a future tribulation timeline, correct? Okay, so we agree on that one. But what they're going to try to do is that they're going to try to apply the Matthew 24 timeline. They're going to apply that to a first century aspect. And you might say, that's impossible. How can you do that? So they're going to argue it in this way. How they argue is in verse 34. Verily I say unto you, what kind of generation? This generation shall not pass till what? All these things be fulfilled. So that's their go-to card. So basically, see, everything that, it, that occurs at Matthew 24, it's all fulfilled by the generation who was alive during Jesus' timeline because it says this generation. So that's how uh, these preterists will argue. Now, the other argument that they will use is that because they keep saying this generation, their favorite line and Gary's favorite line is saying this way. When I was doing when I was doing the debate and I don't care about your debate. That doesn't see they always talk like that. That way they can make themselves look uh, that way they can get some kind of credential, you know. That way they can get some kind of recognition. I don't care, you know. I debate with my brother every single day. That don't make me a scholar, okay? All right. Well, anyway, by the way, he's a lawyer, so I think I got better, uh, better intellectual abilities than Gary does then probably. Okay, anyways, aside from that fact, so, okay, why do I talk like that? Because I have zero respect of people who act that elitist attitude to control the minds of the people. I don't like that at all. I don't like that at all. You know what you get from me? Pure honesty. That's me. That's me. I show you love, I show you love. If I'm going to teach the truth, even if it's unpopular, I'm going to do it. Why? Because I care more about your soul more than pleasing myself Amen. by getting recognized by you. Amen. All right. So anyways, so let's cover these people. So they, uh, Gary argues that it says this generation. Every time Jesus says this generation in the book of Matthew, that it's referring to the generation currently of the first century Jews. So that's his go-to card. Um, no, you're a liar, Gary. Okay, so let's look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. All right, so let's look at every mention right here concerning this generation in Matthew alone. Let's only look at Matthew alone, okay? Shall we do that? Let's look at Matthew chapter 23. And then we're going to read verse 39. Uh, verse 36, actually, that's better. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall call, come upon who? This generation. this generation. Okay, so some of them might argue that, yes, it was fulfilled, verse 34, 35, upon this generation. That's how the preterists might argue. So it was fulfilled, but they don't keep reading here. Look at verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so they're going to argue right here that, so notice that this is referring to a first century timeline of the abomination of desolation at Matthew 24, so it's already fulfilled. Uh, read verse 39. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth. They're not going to see Jesus. Till, till when? Ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Look at that. So this is not what they're thinking. Israel, they did lose their nation, right? And God promised them that. That did happen at the first century. But God gave a promise, and there are too many Old Testament books on it. Too many Old Testament books that God will one day restore the nation of Israel, and they will receive their Messiah King. Verse 39 showed you that in the future, see, Israel is what? Desolate until when? Until they recognize their Messiah King. Okay, so guess what? Back to the future, Durbin. Back to the future, Gary. You don't like that. We put it first century. No, go back to the future. Yeah. Oh, this is sci-fi stuff. No, I'm going by scripture here. But let's also look at another passage. We're going to look at Matthew 
chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Now notice right here that in this passage that this generation applies to an individual. It is true there is something prophetic that can apply to the nation of Israel, but this definitely is beyond that. It's applying to an individual. Let's look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 45. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Okay, isn't that true today? Yes, demon possession is alive and well today. You can get seven more demons and you can get even worse than before. Look at verse 45 where it says, Even so shall it be also unto what? This wicked generation. Okay, it is true Jesus is talking about the nation of Israel. That's why they had seven more devils, right? I mean, you saw that the, the demons growing as they kept resisting and per even persecuting Jesus' followers. But this is, you can't just limit it to first, uh, first century. You're going to limit verse 45 only to first century? No, this is beyond that. This is for every individual as well. This is definitely proven at the book of Luke as well, if you actually look at the book of Luke. So look at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Look at the wording right here at Luke 11. This is definitely an individual. So this generation is only referring to a first century timeline. Be quiet, man. You don't know what you're talking about. The guy claims every time this generation is mentioned that it's referring to first century timeline in the book of Matthew. Did he even read? You know what he did? I'll tell you what he did. He just simply used Google search like an amateur, typed down this generation, and only looked up that verse and found a particular context that can fulfill for first century generation. You know what, he, what, he, what they failed to do? They failed to look at the entire context. What's so funny to me is that these uh, Calvinists and so-called scholars, they always accuse us Bible believers that uh, when we argue scripture for scripture, we're playing jigsaw puzzles and going random verses. Look what they just did. They accuse us for not following proper exegesis and using eisegesis because we weren't going by the context. Look who's the hypocrite. Who wasn't going by context? Look who's the hypocrite. Who was playing video games on, let's use random verses on this generation to prove our point. See that? Liars at his finest. But they cloak themselves with nicety, professionalism, and eloquence that it fools the simple hearted that this is a nice guy and you're a mean pastor. No, I'm calling it out as it is. Calling it out as it is. I don't like this kind of facade where you pretend. Exactly. I don't like that. Amen. Be real. All right, let's look at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. We're going to look at the book of Luke chapter 11 and uh, look at verse 26. 26. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. That's repeating Matthew, right? About this wicked generation. Okay, look at this. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. That's an individual. That's an, any individual. That's that man, see? So, the, by the way, let's go, jump to Matthew 24, okay? They didn't even look at their own key passage of Matthew 24. Look, look at over here, Matthew 24. There are, there are a few, now I don't know if Durbin teaches this, but there are a few that claim that the sun darkened, moon not giving light, and then uh, fire and blood and all that kind of stuff is referring to John the Baptist saying, I baptize you with water, but he, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So that was fulfilled at Acts chapter 2 at Matthew 24. No, this don't look like Acts 2 to me. Look at Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That don't look like Acts chapter 2 to me, okay? <laughs> but they want to apply this to a first century timeline. Okay, if you want to do that, then you got a problem here. So let me just close it right here because I actually covered it more intensely at my Revelation verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. So let me just make this simple. 
You know what the simple debunking to this is? All you have to do is compare the wording of Matthew 24 verses uh, 29 through 31 and see Revelation chapter 6. Now when you compare these two, what it's showing right here is that the islands are removed out of its place. Right. Now, knowing these guys, these preterists, they're going to find whatever island was out there that may have moved one centimeter <laughs> right. during the destruction of Jerusalem to prove their point. And I, that may be sarcastic, but I'm not lying. That's literally what you have to do to stretch it. To stretch it to a first century timeline, look at their interpretations. They will look at anything historical that's a little bit of an indication or a nudge enough to prove the verse. Like, this fulfilled Bible prophecy. No, that's what an atheist would laugh at, saying this doesn't fulfill prophecy at all. Right, right. You're, you're lying about Bible prophecy then and giving credence to the atheist. Yeah. See, that's not good. So we take it literally. If we say island out of the place, guess what? It's getting out of there. Right. And it says the mountains and the rocks uh, that it's going to fall on them. Right. And they actually say, hide us from the face of him that's coming. Yeah, right. That never happened. Yeah, right. Jesus is coming. Mm -hmm. All right, so these preterists, they could believe that Jesus' literal coming, he'll come down someday at the future. But guess what? That future event is tied right here at Matthew 24. Exactly. It's tied to this end times tribulation stuff at Matthew 24, Revelation 6. Don't put all of that first century. That's nonsense. And if you want to stretch it beyond the imagination in some way, and you can, you, some of you are wondering, how do they do it? There's no way you can do it. Trust me, if you go by this really good and you're used to bragging about 100 debates, you're used to lying so much yeah. that you can come up with an interpretation on the spot. Yeah, right. You ever met a good liar before that was very persuasive? Very good liars, and I'm not lying about this either. Yeah. Very good liars, they're good at it. Why? Because they develop the habit of doing it on the spot that convinces a person. Yeah. And that makes me very troubled and concerned concerning Jeffrey and, and Gary right here. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff and Gary, I don't know if they've gotten so used to that habit of conjuring something on the spot like that. That's why they love debating. You know why they love debating? They, they're used to lying and coming up with arguments on the spot. Rather than spending time in scripture, Amen. meditating and praying, is this true or not, Lord? You know what I do before I teach this? Is this true or not, Lord? That's good. If my critics criticize me online, you know what I do when I respond back? You get angry and bash them over the head. No. I pray, meditate, Lord, am I wrong? If I'm wrong, please show me. And if I'm right, you need to show me how to preach and teach it. And I'm sorry, you might dis God might not do this with you, but he does this with me. After I read and pray about it, God says, you got to kick them. And I kick them. Amen, brother. That's, but not every preacher is called to do it the way that I do. But why do you do that, Pastor? You know why? Because we live in a day and age now where we lost that kick of the Great Awakening revivals and biblical prophets where they act and Jesus himself in Matthew 23, where he actually kicked and exposed it for what it is. It's gotten too much to niceties right. and politics. Yeah. That's the thing about churches. We don't play politics or niceties. We do it as the scripture says. Amen. Do I act mean and greedy and sarcastic all the time? No, then I'm not right with God. Right. You know what people don't have the sense of? A time, a place, the right people, yeah. mm -hmm. the right direction, to do the kicking, to do the kindness, to do the gentleness, Amen. to do hard preaching. That's right. People lost that balance. They think it's either or, either or. And when you do that, God will not bless your ministry. Yeah, good, you lost your balance. You think the Bible was purely about niceties? <laughs> do you think the Bible was pure, uh, purely about meanness? Mm -hmm. Or did it pick a time, yes, a place and context and situation? where it was right to show them the positive word or the negative word. Okay, so that should debunk preterism, preterism. Yeah.